And thank you so much of you for dragging yourselves out of bed this morning to be here. Um, we've had very good introductions already to the neutron electric dipole moment and to the proton and deuteron storage ring experiments. And so I will deviate from what I was originally asked to do and not focus on the neutron, but rather talk about nuclei and how and why it's important to have a large set of EDM experiments to constrain different potential high energy sources of CP violation. So to set the stage, I'd like to just recount for you an interesting conversation between my PhD advisor, Tim Chupp, and Michael Ramsey Musoff maybe five or six years ago. So Tim asks Michael, how many EDM experiments do we actually need? And Michael's response is, well, you only need the one that actually discovers an EDM. And then Tim was annoyed that he didn't know which experimental system to work on after that. But we can try to elucidate this question a little bit. And I'll try to cover a lot of things without going into any of them in excruciating detail. But please feel free to ask questions, and I can at least direct you to references that have more details than I'll tell you right now. But starting out, we'll cover a little bit the landscape of global analysis of static EDMs and see how different systems can jointly constrain effective field theory parameters and maybe tell us something about the underlying high energy sources of CP violation and justify a bit wider so many different EDM experiments. Then I'll tell you about nuclear EDMs in particular, and in particular among them, an experiment measuring the electric dipole moment of the xenon-129 nucleus that I've been involved in for the last five years or so. And then I'll very briefly tell you that we are trying to measure the neutron EDM at the ILL as well, just show you a couple of pictures and make you aware that it's happening. So to borrow a feeder from Michael, this is one way of conceptualizing the flow down of high energy CP violation into things that experiments can measure. So if you suppose that you have some beyond standard model CP violating physics, whether it's coming from supersymmetry, from left-right symmetric, from whatever, you can look for this in collider searches. You can expect it might exist because we have the baryonic symmetry from the early universe. But then to get down to what experiments actually measure, namely nuclear, atomic, and electron moments, we have to have a relatively complex effective field theory apparatus for taking the high energy CP violation, rephrasing it in terms of weak scale operators that only deal with standard model fields, and then taking those into the hadronic, the nuclear, the molecular, the atomic, whatever energy scale the particular experiment is designed to probe. And it turns out that there are about 13 independent parameters that matter if you make some reasonably general assumptions about how you can write down the CP violation in an effective field theory. And then at the hadronic and nuclear level, you have a much smaller number of parameters that can be jointly constrained by a set of half a dozen experiments or so. And some of those have been done for a long time. We've heard a little bit already about mercury parenthetically. And some of them are really in early stages, even though the ideas have been around for a long time. So measuring proton and deuteron EDMs. And I'll try to tell a little bit why it's important to do all of these things. Um, but this is just a preview of the general scheme of dependencies. So whatever your basic source of CP violation is, it lands into these 12 or 13 Wilson coefficients that determine what you see at low energies. You've heard a lot about the theta parameter in the QCD Lagrangian, but there are also fundamental, not really fundamental, but basic EDMs of fermions arising from photon couplings, but also from chromodynamic couplings. There are tensor scalar and pseudoscalar semi-leptonic contributions. All of these mixed together into hadronic and nuclear systems, and then there are additional pieces which tend to dominate in paramagnetic systems that in this scheme, just sort of skip down the energy scales. But what we'll focus on for the second 30% of the talk or so is how the theta term, the proton and neutron dipole moments, and these pi and nucleon couplings end up in nuclei, get suppressed or enhanced by shift screening, 
and the nuclear shift moments, and then arrive somewhere that we can act actually measure them. But basically, the scheme is that you can divide EDM experiments into three classes. You have the neutron and the proton, if you like. You have diamagnetic atoms and molecules, and you have paramagnetic atoms and molecules, and these have approximately the following primary sensitivities. So, where do we begin? We have some fundamental Lagrangian that violates CP. This has qualitatively three components. We have the theta term that we know and love. We have the CK unmixing phase. And we have whatever comes from beyond the stepping model. These can be parameterized as follows. I won't talk in detail about the theta term because that's kind of been well covered in the context of axions. The beyond standard model term is really the interesting one and what motivates a lot of the experimentalists looking for EDMs. And if you bring this into an effective field theory at the weak scale, then you're essentially writing it in terms of standard model fields with effective operators that enter at a dimension of six or more, and the corresponding amplitudes are suppressed by the ratio of the Higgs bound to the scale of the physics raised to a power of the operator dimension minus four to get the right dimension of the action. And then the CKM phase, of course, you mix with the CKM matrix, the up and down quarks, by W fields, and you have this producing additional couplings, semi-leptonic, G pi's, so forth. So at the hadronic scale, where does this leave us? Our starting point is kind of this effective term for T violation and P violation in pi nucleon interaction. So this corresponds to the longer range component once you have taken out the short range sort of intrinsic proton and neutron EDMs, if you like. So you have two linear combinations of these short range pieces that give you the proton or the neutron, depending on whether there's a plus or minus sign, connecting them. These are coupled with the spin of the nucleus, the velocity, the photon field, and you have then the various pion couplings at different rights, which mainly will end up focusing on these two because due to chiral symmetry considerations, the rank 2, 1 is highly suppressed. Then we have scalar and tensor semi-leptonic contributions. So these CS and CT, the isoscalar and isovector pieces, are what mix the electrons in an atom into CP violating moments in a nucleus. So these are particularly interesting in diamagnetic systems where all of the electrons are paired off and you have no residual paramagnetic effects that would be dominated by the electron EDM in a cesium atom or in a diatomic molecule that places the electron in a high effective electric field. So these are again all in terms of standard model fields and when we bring them down into the nucleon and nuclear scale, we end up with terms that look like this. So we've dropped out the pi, the g pi two, and you can actually calculate explicitly in terms of all of the parameters that we've seen over the last couple of days, what the neutron and proton mediums should be in terms of reasonable assumptions. And we have shift moment, so you have contributions from the individual nucleon. You have the G pi 0, G pi 1, and G pi 2. And this lands in the EDM of a diamagnetic atom or molecule together with the semi-leptonic contributions where the coefficients simply parameterize how sensitive the given system is to a given effective source of CP violation. So in broad strokes, this is the framework for saying how an unknown source of CP violation at a high energy scale is propagated through the weak scale into an effective field theory at hadronic and nuclear levels, and then into something that you might measure in an atom. The basic <coughs> message is that nuclear theorists are perfectly capable of calculating what most of these coefficients, the A0, the A1, for example, would be in, let's say, a mercury nucleus, and then you can suspect that when you measure a mercury nuclear EDM, you would have a particular sensitivity to a linear combination of the corresponding sources of CP violation. So what you would finally need, if you want to know how these different sources are entering 
at a higher energy scale, you need to constrain by measuring the EDM in different systems, since when you measure the EDM of mercury nucleus, let's say, you're only getting this one number up. But if you have an idea of what its shift moment would be, or how sensitive it is to a particular semi-leptonic coupling, then you can combine it with a measurement in another system that has a different linear dependence, and you can conclude something about the relative strength of these effects in different systems, and maybe even learn something about the fundamental source of CP violation. So the apparatus for doing that is to parameterize each EDM in each system you might want to measure. We have simply four diamagnetic systems here. In terms of the various coefficients and a matrix that tells you how much each one contributes to each system. So you have this matrix where these are the primary contributions, these are the systems, you invert the matrix, and then, yes, Chen. Oh, so the, the G pi 0, yes. 1, so those are CP violating? Um, these are CP violating pi on nuclear interactions. So are there other scattering experiments that can give you those information? In principle, I guess there are. I don't have a detailed answer to that, though. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's perfectly valid to look for CP violating physics and things other than static storage EDM terms, and that would... So, way back on the first slide, for example, we have collider searches that probe some of this stuff directly. But uh, where we get lucky is more in the low energy systems where some of these coefficients might be particularly large. So if you do this, if you take the actual EDM bounds for each of these systems, invert the matrix, and say what the joint constraint gives you in terms of each, then you can make these types of parameter space plots where if you have more or less of, uh, say, g pi 0, then there is a corresponding increase or decrease in the associated bound of the short range part of the neutron medium. And you can do this for all of the parameters that enter. And what you notice is that the situation is a lot more relaxed than you would typically assume from an EDM bound that's quoted by an experimental group. That's because the experimental groups tend to just say our EDM from an electron as measured in, say, a molecular system is due entirely to the fundamental electron medium, or neglecting, in that case, the scalar semi-leptonic coupling. In the nuclear systems, we have even more parameters entering, and so the bounds become even more relaxed, typically by several orders of magnitude. So it's actually quite important to find systems that cut orthogonal tracks through this parameter space and give us not just single source constraints, but joint constraints that tell us really that uh, this entire ellipse is well concentrated around zero and not just that one parameter can compensate for another by orthogonal and precision. So to go back here, we have in an effective theory, a CP violating vertex here, which might look like a penguin diagram with a heavy quark. That's a contribution to the neutron EDM in this case. And we have short range intrinsic EDMs, if you like, arising from these types of interactions in the nucleons and the electron. We have pion nucleon couplings that enter the neutron and diamagnetic systems. We have semi leptonic couplings, which in turn both diamagnetic and paramagnetic atomic and molecular systems. There's, there's a lot going on. But what can experiments actually measure? Typically, a low energy. EDM experiment looking for a static electric dipole moment takes some object with a spin with a well-defined quantum ground state, puts it in an electric and a magnetic field, and measures an energy splitting between its states as a function of the relative direction of the field. And this is only extrapolating from the linear coupling of dipoles to photon fields what the parity linear shift this term would be as a frequency measurement normally. So among experimentalists, it's practically canonical wisdom that if you want to know something precisely, you find a way to measure it as a frequency. And then 
the dipole moment bound typically gets rephrased in terms of a counting experiment where you have noise sources arising from phase fluctuations in the frequency measurement and from shot noise because you have a finite number of particles being interrogated. But this is the essential paradigm for all current experimental EDM measurements, even if the mechanism is slightly modified in a storage ring experiment. You're looking for this type of energy splitting, and you're dominated by the same types of systematic effects. So the statistical sensitivity that you can reach, you can almost write down from dimensional analysis. And it becomes immediately clear that you want as many particles as possible, you want as high a signal to noise as possible, you want as high an electric field as possible, and you want a corresponding bandwidth and coherence time for the overall measurement. So in the case of the xenon EDM that I'll talk about in a minute, these are some numbers to keep in mind for the parameters in this equation. And by plugging them in, you arrive at something on the order of 10 to the minus 27 e centimeters per experimental run. You have to rephrase some of these in terms of the experimental details of a particular system. So the number of particles might not be the number trapped in a storage cell, but it might be a particle current in a beam. Either way, the statistical sensitivity scales in a similar fashion, and you're finally limited by similar classes of systematic effects. So nuclear EDMs, in particular, have many systems to choose from. And in the absence of a theoretical motivation to choose a particular one or other based on its dependence on underlying effective field theory, we have experimental motivations to choose ones that are particularly convenient to work with. So mercury is a particularly nice example. It's a diamagnetic atom with all paired electrons in the spin one half nucleus and the 199 isotope. And although atoms with all paired electrons are normally annoying to work with because the excitation energies are so high that they exclude conventional laser spectroscopy, mercury is viable. And so it can be polarized directly with a laser. You can hold a high density of particles in a small cell. So the residual field gradients and things that we heard limit neutron EDM experiments from Chen Yu because of the extended volumes are much less of a limitation. And you can reach a fantastic precision. Admittedly, they've been doing this for a long time. So they've had a while to refine the details of the apparatus. But the motivation is finally to rephrase this in terms of a shift moment, a bound on the neutron or proton EDM, to say something about the source underneath. And mercury is a bit tricky because some of those parameters are not entirely clear. Not necessarily because they can't be calculated, but because they haven't been. For example, the sign of the G pi 1 coefficient is still unknown in the mercury system. So we don't know if it adds to or subtracts from the rest of what's going on in that nucleus. Radon is a radon and radium, sorry, I put radium here, is a particularly interesting system because there are nuclei with shape deformations that enhance their sensitivity to shift moments because of close-lying energy states that make a parity doublet near the ground level. So you can think of this a little bit in analogy to what Chen Yu described for the ammonia molecule, except that in this case, the parity eigenstates are the energy eigenstates, and the dipole moment is permanent. So you don't need an external field to induce a dipole before you can measure it. And this corresponds to an enhancement of the shift moment by between two and three orders of magnitude. So radium is also experimentally lucky because it can be laser cooled and trapped. It's experimentally unlucky because the nucleus of interest is not stable. So there's normally a price to pay. But uh, they've proved the principle of this new technique based on techniques borrowed from atomic physics. And it's actually not obvious when you look at these two numbers, but you probably gain more in terms of a joint constraint on CP violation parameters from increasing an order of magnitude and sensitivity of the radium experiment than you do from doing the same in mercury. Xenon-129 is another system 
This bound dates from 2001, so it's been a while since it was updated. And I'll tell you a little bit in a minute about how myself and some colleagues are attempting to do that. And then there's a diamagnetic molecule thallium fluoride, which is particularly interesting for the same reason that radium and radon would be because of the shift moment enhancement. And it seems that there might be some prospects for laser cooling this without the enormous losses that are frequently associated with molecular spectroscopy and cooling of molecules. So, xenon EDM measurements. Basically, you have a small source of polarized xenon atoms here. This is a cell a few centimeters in diameter made from glass. The nuclei are polarized by spin exchange optical pumping. These techniques are different in every system, and it's part of why the number of independent systems under study is still relatively low, because if you go from xenon to radium, say, there's very little crossover. But the xenon is particularly nice because you can borrow techniques from conventional NMR, reduce the magnetic field amplitude to a microtesla or so, 1 50th of Earth's field. And what we were able to do was to benefit from the magnetic shielding of the neutron EDM experiment that is now being commissioned at the ILL. And this was nice because the residual fields in the central cubic meter or so of space are the smallest that we know to exist in the solar system. So the gradient over a few centimeter cell can be neglected entirely. And you're left with internal back action effects between the xenon atoms and the helium-3 atoms that are used as a comagnetometer. The polarized spins persist. There's a bias field provided by Humboldt's coils. And there's a non-magnetic squid door sitting very close above the cell, which directly reads out the magnetic field from the processing spins. So you're essentially doing nuclear magnetic resonance at 10 hertz or so, and then watching the spins evolve. And so this is actually mostly irrelevant um, because the frequency bandwidth that we care about is essentially a DC shielding factor in this range. Um, the two shields from Munich about here, and the reason the experiment is being currently run in Berlin is the five orders of magnitude that you gain by adding five layers of new metal. The residual gradients in the Berlin shield are not as good, but they also don't need to be because the cell is so small. The processing spins get read out like this. You have a closer view of the cell. You have a frequency spectrum when you Fourier transform the oscillating signal in time, which I thought I had, there it is. So this is what you see over several hours of measurement. So nuclear magnetic resonance at 10 hertz with a ring down time scale of thousands of seconds. And if you zoom in a lot, you can see it's not just a simple sine wave, but it's actually a beat between the helium and the xenon nuclei. And we can fit this to a function inside of a block where the decay constant doesn't substantially affect the fit, phase match it to the next block, and by reversing the polarity at high voltage that's applied to it periodically, we've done an EDM measurement. The comagnetometer correction from the second frequency that's directly superposed in the measured signal works like this. And you have, if I go back to the Fourier transform for a moment, very well resolved xenon and helium peaks at 17 and 44 hertz or so. So the noise level here is exquisitely low. It's not the lowest it could possibly be because squid technology is very good, but it's actually not the leading limitation in the experiment. It's a conceptually very simple experiment because you polarize the atoms outside of the shield, you bring them into the shield, you tip them with a pi over two pulse, you wait, and you measure. The problem is that they're very hard to polarize. Yes, change. What's the pressure of the xenon at the helium? So the total pressure is about an atmosphere, and the partial pressure is mostly helium, up to 800 millibar or so. Helium-3. Helium-3, yeah, with the remainder split evenly between xenon and nitrogen. Mm 
Why do we need nitrogen? Because the polarization is done by spin exchange optical pumping, and if you don't collisionally quench the excitation of the rubidium atoms that are used to polarize it, then you lose. So, this was what we measured a year ago, and this was what came out of it. The result is essentially a statistical sensitivity where in one week you arrive at the six month precision of the 2001 experiment. So, I don't know if you can read it very well, but one of these grids is approximately 10 to the minus 26 e centimeters, and the previous EDM limit was a few times 10 to the minus 27. So, with statistical scatter and averaging, you have a bound shown by the of course, there are systematic errors to take care of as well, and those are what really take time in an EDM experiment. This is an emphatically non-exhaustive list of ones that could conceivably enter to this one. In particular, leakage currents pose a problem because if you change the voltage on the electrodes to change the direction of the electric field, then you have some charge flowing, and the charge flows in a way that it can produce a magnetic field which doesn't reverse with the E field or with the B field, and so you end up with an E linear term in your analysis that looks like an EDM, even though it's just a few picoamperes of charge flowing between the electrodes across the cell. So you can measure the leakage current effect, and you can do one better. You can put a leakage current across the cell by winding a loop of wire, putting a minuscule current in it, and seeing what frequency shift occurs. So you can directly calibrate this. But the point is really to set an absolute upper limit on the size of the effect, and then combine it in quadrature with everything else that could be entering under the assumption that if this worst case scenario looks pretty good, then we can have some confidence in the final number. So the data analysis finally proceeds in terms of a frequency extraction from the phase residuals. So over 15,000 seconds or so, you'll notice that the phase, even with the comagnetometer correction, is not perfectly linear. And this poses a problem because it means there's some higher order effect entering in the coupling of the two frequencies. In fact, it's not a surprise that something like that would happen because if you do a clock comparison measurement, the figure in merit, is typically an Allen deviation, which is a weighted variance over point-to-point -point correlations. And this has a characteristic minimum at the crossover between phase noise and frequency noise, basically whether you're dominated by drifts or by intrinsic instabilities. And when you get past this minimum, then whatever drift spectrum of the fields you apply occurs in your experiment will somehow affect the corrected field on the long enough time scale. So you have to stop your experiment at the right point, restart it again, and only compare numbers that were measured over a time scale where the error correction makes sense. So that's part of why the high voltage is reversed so frequently, and it's part of why a typical EDM run wouldn't actually go so long, it would stop at 10 or 12,000 seconds. So, how do we check all of these systematics? Basically, the task is to measure every possible correlation of every possible param parameter and to demonstrate that they have no effect. So what can you change? You can change the gas pressure in the cell. You can change the leakage current that you apply. You can change the map rate of the high voltage to see if that scales a real leakage current instead of a fake one. And you can change the frequency of E-field reversals, the magnitude of the magnetic field. You do all of these things, and you believe that you're doing something that makes sense when they all show a more or less reasonable statistical scatter around zero. This time, the bars are two times 10 to the minus 27 E centimeters, which is very nearly the 2001 EDM limit on the Zeno Newtons. So what can we do to make it better? The leakage current monitor is still not perfect. We're trying to measure picoamperes reliably on time scales of hours, and the momentary fluctuation is the size of the entire systematic error budget. So 
having a good electronic system to do that is entirely indispensable. To make a higher polarization of the noble gas nuclei that you load in the cell in the first place is essentially the only thing apart from increasing that electric field that you can do which scales the final sensitivity linearly. So that's an exceptionally good idea, but it's also exceptionally difficult because neutron physicists have been working on high polarization of helium-3 nuclei for a long time, and they've gotten quite advanced. Xenon is not so far technologically advanced, but there's some possibility to improve, and that's a good task for the next year or so. Tip angles of the NMR pulses can be particularly tricky because if you haven't completely transversalized your longitudinal spins, then the spins of the co-magnetometer and the primary species will couple to each other. And this is a nonlinear effect, which will then rotate the xenon spins out of the plane and produce an apparent frequency shift that's not canceled by the co-magnetometer. So you actually need a pulse calibration better than a degree to have confidence in the final result. And of course, as you add more parameters, you have to add more configurations to check that you haven't introduced any new systematic errors. So very quickly, since Peter just told me I'm down to five minutes, I'll tell you what's happening across the fence at the ILL. This is the shield for MIMA that was used for the Xenon EDM measurements, which are now in Berlin, which means it's free for its intended purpose to measure the neutron EDM. This is roughly a three meter cube of mu metal. What's shown here is the two outer layers with an, a layer of RF shielding in between. And an insert with three additional layers slides into the center of that. The residuals that I told you were the smallest field in the solar system over an extended volume are mapped like this. So you put a squid or a very sensitive atomic magnetometer in the center of the room you move it around and you measure below 200 picotesla, peak to peak, over a cubic meter. So this is compatible with a next generation EDM search without a co-magnetometer, which is a controversial statement, yes. but we're sticking by it. And I'm happy to answer questions about that. This is the concept for how it's installed at the ILL. The shields are actually there right now. The clean room next to it is out for tender, and we have two offers that came in this week. And the ultra cold neutron source SuperSun is installed about a meter away on the side. So the direction of the feeding neutron beam for UCN production is this way. This is the old prime medium position in IL 22. The shields were delivered after a long and stressful period of construction work in the experimental hall. And they finally arrived like this on a forklift on November 30th, which was the last day before it snowed in 2017. And there they are. This is the frame which holds the interior door for the interior three-layer shield being positioned to slide inside. And that's the last slide. So I'll be happy to answer questions on any of you. Part of this very complete talk on the whole, I was pleased to see you as Superman standing on the shielding here in IL22. You have to do this next week for the workshop that the people can see you there. Okay, I'm sure there are questions, comments, please. Um, no. Did you analyze that data already to exclude axial light parameter? We don't even have a final EV on the limit. But you have very nice data that you can probably translate into axion like parameters. We probably can. We've been focused on the static EDM, but of course there's no reason we couldn't do this. Did you blind your data? Yes. Good question. It's going to be very nerve wracking live for you, blind. Yes. It's already in the brain. <laughs> Um, did yeah, you try to run the high voltage at a uh, different value, say lower, just to see, because the leakage yeah. current might not be linear with the high voltage? That's right, and it's almost certainly not. So it stabilizes a bit if you high voltage train the cells, 
but uh, in fact, we lost about 25% of the final high voltage that we expected to achieve based on the initial tests. Mm -hmm. And the ramp rate was finally chosen with a generous safety margin based on how we could attain that 75% of what we felt we wanted. So there were and any run with a breakdown or so is, is automatically discarded. Uh, yeah, one of them. Okay. Yeah. yeah. How could you control the leakage current systematics in the neutron DM without the magnetometer? By an optically decoupled leakage current monitor sitting in the high voltage control. Say it again. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't show you at all the scheme for the neutron EDM measurement, but it's basically a four cell stack where you have electric fields up and down symmetrically and a common bias field. So this is done by putting a high voltage in the center electrode and then having ground on either side. And what you can do, obviously you can monitor what the high voltage supply tells you, but you can do better than that. You can actually take the copper feed of the high voltage, which is hollow, and you can measure with a little floating monitor what the drop to ground is where you decide uh -huh. where the ground sits. And then this is optically decoupled, and it reads out a little photodiode signal, and it's powered in the other direction by a laser. So you have a direct measurement of any current that flows out of the high voltage electrode. So you don't, so in addition to the ground, Yes. Do they the agree? ground is the easy part. Yeah. Do they agree? Well, we haven't been able to assemble the stack inside the shield yet, so okay. it's impossible to say. <laughs> but I, I mean, yes, the, the apparatus essentially seems to work if you test it with currents and with thermal fluctuations. We just haven't put high voltage on the cells and used it in real. So you, you say you have four cells, so the other two are just. Yes. Uh, so this is the other reason you can get away without using a co-magnetometer. So you have UCM here and here, and you have mercury in the top and bottom, and that gives you a radiometer stack in exactly the way that it's used for the mercury and the mm -hmm. And if your residual fields have small enough gradients, and if the gradient drift is slow enough, then you get all of the information you need on small bandwidths from the mercury, and all of the information you need on large bandwidths from an array of cesium magnetometers next to the cells. Yes. Uh, what if the charging current uh, magnetizes something? Because there are many other ways of direct correlation between E field and B field, other than uh, leakage currents. Of course, you have to assume that you see it in mercury, or that if you have a real breakdown event or a near threshold breakdown, that you would see it in the cesium. So, of course, everything is magnetically screened before it goes in, but if you actually charge it in the experiments, then of course you're relying on the atomic magnetometers. Okay. When do you expect to put neutron in the NEB? Much <laughs> later than I was hoping. Okay. Um, next year. Next year. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, please. Well, what's your protect projected sensitivities for this? So in this configuration, you can measure it to 10 to the minus 27. The ultimate limit of the apparatus is 10 to the minus 28. But for this, you certainly need a co-magnetometer. And you need to solve a few more technological issues and systematic problems that are bound to arise on the road to 10 to the minus 27. <coughs> so same question for the Xenon, DM. This has a fundamental limit in the current scheme of about 10 to the minus 29. And that's limited by this effect I alluded to, where an imperfect pi over 2 pulse leaves a residual coupling between the xenon and the co-magnetometer. These are high-density polarized gases. And the problem is actually that in a cell, you have a shape shift in addition to whatever bias field is drifting. And even a, so in a perfectly spherical cell, this cancels because it's a perfect dipole. And there's no residual nuclear interaction inside. But there's no such thing as a 
perfectly spherical cell, and what you find is that the residual polarized gas in the stem talks to the cell, the cell talks to the stem, and you have a quite complicated back action between the xenon and the helium. In a cylinder, you have the same thing because it's also not a sphere. So with that sensitivity, how does that translate to neutral EDM in the xenon? Oh, if you want to use both of them to put a bound on the same thing. Mm -hmm. So you have, xenon is reasonably well shift enhanced, but it's not optical deformed, and its primary sensitivities are actually to the G-pies. So I think the direct neutron EDM contribution is suppressed by a couple of orders of magnitude. Mm -hmm. But uh, I can give you a reference where the table is laid out explicitly. Okay, I see no more hands up. Thanks again, Simon.